Hello everyone, today we're continuing our deep dive of Richard Dawkins and Yan Wong's book, The Ancestor's Tale. In this episode, we're going to discuss extended phenotypes, so let's jump right in. Remember from high school biology that you have a genotype and a phenotype. Your genotype is the unique combination of alleles that you possess, and your phenotype is the expression of your genotype. As we remember from the poorly named central dogma of biology, DNA is transcribed into RNA, which is then translated into an amino acid sequence that folds to make a protein. We typically think of the phenotype as the complete set of biological structures made as the result of gene transcription and translation, all our cells, tissues, and organs. At least, that's what we normally think. But what if I told you that there's more to a phenotype than what exists in your body? What if we could extend the phenotype concept to things outside our bodies? In 1982, Richard Dawkins published his book, The Extended Phenotype, in which he argued that the concept of the phenotype should encompass not just blood and bones or leaves and stems, but also the collection of effects the gene has on the environment. However, Dawkins lays down his arguments for this idea from a gene-centric view of evolution, which he previously outlined in his older book, The Selfish Gene. This metaphor has been criticized as highly reductive by other evolutionary biologists, most prominently Richard Lewinton and Stephen Jay Gould, who take a pluralistic view that evolution acts on different levels, not just genes. Nevertheless, the idea of the extended phenotype has a generalized counterpart called niche construction. This process involves feedback between the organisms and their environments, in which the organisms modify the environment, subsequently altering the selective pressures, which in turn will influence the evolution of organisms. Such feedback can be reciprocal, wherein the same species is also affected by the very environmental change it has caused and or the environmental change affects other species. Let's take an example. Toxoplasma gondii is a protozoan parasite that normally uses cats as its final host. Infected cats shed toxoplasma oocysts in their feces, and these oocysts can infect rats. The infected rats then, bizarrely, show no aversion to cats, and this, understandably, results in the rats being eaten by the cats, infecting the cats. Evidently, Toxoplasma alters the rat's amygdala, forcing the rat to forego its innate cat-averting behavior. The rat then merely exists as an extension of Toxoplasma, an extension of the parasite's phenotype. This is far from a rare case. Parasites are well known to alter host behavior for means of reproduction. Similar to the previous case, acanthocephalin worms cause amphipods to swim towards light, making them observable to predatory fish so that the worm can finish its life cycle in the fish. Another famous example is the control of ants by the parasitic fungus Ophiocordyceps unilateralis. Spores from Ophiocordyceps rain down on unsuspecting ants, and the growing fungus forces the ant to go on a random walk until it finds a place that meets Ophiocordyceps' expectations usually a leaf not far from the ground. Then the ant clamps down with its jaws on the leaf, and the newly mature Ophiocordyceps can now rain down its spores on more ants. The infected ants are extended phenotypes of Ophiocordyceps. But niche construction or extended phenotypes don't necessarily have to involve parasites controlling their hosts. A fascinating 2013 study investigated the genetic underpinnings of burrowing behavior in old field mice, or Paramiscus polyonotus. Old field mice are open field specialists restricted to the southeastern United States, and they build burrows where a long entrance leads to a nest cavity, which then leads to another tunnel that terminates just below the soil surface that functions as an escape hatch. Sister to old field mice is the deer mouse, Paramiscus maniculatus, which can be found across fields and forests in North America. Deer mice, by contrast, build small, single-tunnel burrows, so researchers hybridized old field and deer mice to understand the genetic component of their burrowing behavior. The first generation of hybrid offspring produced burrows like old field mice, 
not deer mice, even coming complete with an escape hatch. So the allele, or alleles, for old field mice burrows appear to be dominant to the deer mice burrow alleles. Then, the researchers crossed those first generation hybrids with deer mice, and those offspring, called the recombinant backcross, or BC generation, generated burrows that varied across a continuum between the original parental extremes. About 12% of the BC offspring made entrance burrows as long as old field mice, and nearly half made escape hatches. From this, the researchers inferred that there are at least two genetic modules involved in burrow behavior, one for tunnel length, and one for the escape hatch. Indeed, by genotyping the mice, the researchers found three genomic locations associated with entrance burrow length, and one region associated with escape hatch construction. All four regions are unlinked and segregate on different chromosomes. This is one of the clearest examples of genetic loci contributing to behavior, making the burrows inarguable extensions of the phenotype. What about bird nests? Different bird species build different types of nests. Birds of the family Remizidae, the penduline tits, construct hanging nests, hence their name. The cape penduline tit, Anthoscopus minutus, builds its hanging nests with two entrances, one large false entrance and a second smaller true entrance. The architecture may help protect the chicks inside the nest from snakes and other predators. Likewise, male bowerbirds, which is family Tilonorhynchidae, build structures adorned with brightly colored objects to impress females. But do we have reason to think there's a genetic component to nest or bower building? Abstractly, yes. If all the members of a species have some character in common, whether that be morphological or behavioral, then you can bet there's some sort of genetic component underlying it, even if we don't know the exact genetic or embryological pathway involved. With regard to birds, some studies have shown relationships between internal physiology and external morphology and behavior. For example, a 1999 study showed that male black wheat ears, or Onanthe leucura, that were able to carry many heavy stones to a potential nest site had stronger T-cell mediated immune response than other males. Another study showed that the size of nests is negatively correlated with male tail length in barn swallows, Hirundo rustica. When there is a clear correlation between behavior and morphology, that too is a pretty good indicator of an underlying genetic framework. That should not, however, downplay the fact that individual variations exist, or imply the idea that this behavior in question is 100% governed by genetics. Spiders too often display species-specific web patterns, whether making trapdoors as various spider lineages do, a simple silk line with an adhesive blob on the end like in Mastophora, a single line of web, like in Mia Grimopis, a small net as in Dinopus, or the super long wall-like web of Gastaracantha. Clearly, the diversity of webs correlating with certain species implies a genetic component. Niche construction can induce environmental changes which persist long after the individual organisms. In these cases, the organisms don't just inherit the genes, but also the environment, or specifically the niche, that their ancestors have constructed. A good example is the lemon ants from South America. These ants have a mutualistic relationship with a few species of plants. These plants provide a suitable habitat for the ant colonies where they reside. At the same time, the ants kill all the other plant species in their surroundings by injecting formic acid into the leaves, effectively using their venoms as an herbicide. This behavior leads to areas within the rainforest where conspicuously few tree species are growing, which have been dubbed Devil's Gardens. Sometimes, niche construction leads to major changes to the ecosystem as a whole. Regarding terrestrial ecosystems, there is probably no better example than earthworms. Even though they live on land, earthworms are actually aquatic or semi-aquatic at best, like all annelids are in general. Instead of evolving their own physiology to tolerate dry environments, earthworms alter the soil in such a way that allows them to live on land. This behavior, which is called bioturbation, also improves the soil by making nutrients more available for plants. The ecological importance of worms was recognized by Charles Darwin in his last scientific book, which was published just a year before his death in 1881, wherein he wrote, quote, Worms have played a more important part in the history of the world than most persons would at first suppose, close quote. So what does all of this have to do with beavers? We are still in the same order of mammals as the last tail, Rodentia, but we are now in a different suborder, switching from Myomorpha to Castoromorpha. We're going to look at the family Castoridae, and in particular, the genus Castor. 
The closest relatives of beavers are a totally extinct group of rodents called Eutypomyidae, which lived from the early Eocene to late Miocene across North America and Eurasia. And there are many fossil beavers, the earliest of which is Agnotocaster from the late Eocene to late Oligocene of North America. As one might expect, the primitive Agnotocaster shares characters with both the extinct Eutypomyidae and Castorids. More derived Castorids then lost the Eutypomyid features. Next, we come to three subfamilies, Paleocastorinae, Castoroidinae, and Castorinae. Paleocastorinae are identified by their small stature and digging adaptations, Castoroidinae are very large, and Castorinae, including the extant beavers, have distinct semi-aquatic adaptations. Early castorines, like Steniofiber, have cheek teeth similar to the Paleocastorines, but also primitive semi-aquatic adaptations. These adaptations would, of course, become more pronounced with time. There are two modern species of beavers, the North American beaver, Castor canadensis, and the European beaver, Castor fiber. So, when did beavers attain their famous tree processing abilities? Most fossil evidence of beaver tree processing is Pleistocene in age, and typically attributed to Castor. But the oldest evidence comes from the beaver Dipoides from the early Pliocene. However, Dipoides is a member of Castoroidinae, not Castorinae, like modern beavers. This means either tree processing evolved at least twice independently in Castorids, or the common ancestor of Castor and Dipoides was capable of tree processing. A 2009 analysis argued that the common ancestor of Castoroidinae and Castorinae could fell trees because Castoroidines and Castorines are all found in wetland environments, whereas Paleocastorines are found in arid, open environments. That means Castorids evolved tree processing capabilities at least 24 million years ago in the Oligocene. Possibly, earlier Castorids felled trees to construct nests for warmth, just like modern beavers, as most Castorids are known from whole Arctic regions. In modern beavers, caches of branches are stored underwater and fastened to the pond's substrate, and this behavior is initiated by the first signs of frost. Perhaps then beavers evolved this behavioral strategy to cope with harsh northern latitude winters. Thus, building dams and caches is just as much an adaptation to the environment as the beaver's paddle-shaped tail. One might wonder then, what's the point of calling the beaver dam an extended phenotype? If it's every bit as much a product of genes as the beaver's bones, skin, and fur, then aren't dams just phenotypes? Genes for behaviors aren't intrinsically different from genes for morphology, as we discussed earlier. Another question is, how does this tale relate to human behaviors? Well, that gets us into evolutionary psychology, a thorough discussion of which would take us too far afield for today's purposes. So, to conclude this tale, there are many behaviors that have genetic underpinnings, and in some cases, researchers have been able to trace the developmental and evolutionary histories of those behaviors the reach of the gene can extend far beyond the body. So, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.